Hey, hey, you're back in the garage with Easy Jeezy. Yeah, I'm still working on this transmission and I'm going to get it. I am going to get it. I've been doing my homework and uh, I found some more information, detailed information that's going to help me. Uh, I, uh, I know the ring and pinion's working. This was a swing axle. I converted it to IRS. I got third and fourth working. And uh, the only problem I'm having is with second gear. Once I got that dialed in, we're good to go. So uh, I, I'm anxious to get it apart. But uh, right now I'm letting that 90 weight oil drain and it's a little slow. So uh, if you don't mind giving me that 13 millimeter wrench. I saw you looking at that thing. Uh, I think we're just, uh, this is probably one of the most popular wrenches on a Volkswagen engine or transmission. And I got to keep that just handy as could be all the time. I'm always laying it down someplace. Uh, I'm glad you stopped by because I got something to share with you today too. Uh, I got this little book from uh, Hot Rod Magazine. And uh, it was mailed to me by our friend uh, 71 Type 1 Big W. Thank you very much. Big W. Uh, I really enjoyed reading this and this is uh, Hot Rodding the Volkswagen Engine. It was put out by Hot Rod Magazine in 1964 and uh, my friend uh, Big W was down the street in uh, Portland, Oregon in an antique shop and picked up a bunch of these for next to nothing and he thought I'd be interested in this. I really appreciate that. It was pretty fun and uh, I learned a lot reading about uh, this you know there's a lot of books out that talk about the history of Volkswagens and uh, Ferdinand Porsche's involvement with it and so on and so forth but there was so many fun facts in here that I was not aware of and I was not aware of how much hot rodding was going on with the 36 and 40 horsepower engines that we wouldn't even give a second look at today uh, back in those times uh, they were getting with the program over there uh, and here as well. There was a fellow by the name of uh, Wolfgang Denzel. He was an Australian and uh, he was the first one to really get with these little Volkswagen engines. They were racing the shit out of them over there in Europe and he was making special heads and uh, camshafts and all kinds of special things. They had kits that they put together. And then over the years I'd seen uh, the name Okrasa mentioned in Hot V-Dubs magazine and uh, I always wondered, you know, what was the deal on Okrasa? Uh, some, something that I, but it was all specialized parts that were made in the 50s and imported by MP. MP was privately owned in the 50s uh, and that was, they were very, very highly thought of. They, they were doing a lot of research and development and importing a lot of speed parts. And uh, just like any other form of racing, I mean, there was, the, it was the budget racer. Just like then, just like it is now. And they had all kinds of cool kits. Intake manifolds, bigger carburetors, different exhausts, um, big valve heads. They were taking the little Porsche parts off the Porsche engine and uh, the 1500 Porsche engine and trying to fit them on those 40 and 36 horsepower engines, a little bit bigger valves, uh, using the pistons and cylinders, uh, a completely designed, differently designed head that was actually an improvement over the Porsche design. And uh, I always thought that was amazing. I thought, poor, oh, and then, uh, you, did, did you know that uh, Ferdinand Porsche was hired by American auto manufacturers to consult and, and collaborate with them to design? The, the Volkswagen engine was so simple and so successful, that's why they came out with the uh, General Motors, the Corvair, which was a six-cylinder air-cooled engine. And by golly, these guys jumped on that. When they saw those air-cooled cylinders and pistons, they were bigger than the ones that were on there, and they were trying to fit them onto the little Volkswagen cases so they could increase the displacement. You know, no substitute for displacement. Uh, and, uh, you know, his influence on American cars, that's why the Chrysler used the torsion bar suspension because it was something that was collaborated and recommended to by Ferdinand Porsche and that's what they use in all the Volkswagens the leaf springs in the front torsional design and then the big bar in the back the two bars on each side for the rear suspension uh, Ferdinand Porsche just loved that it was a very compact spring very effective uh, worked well for a long time very durable cheap to manufacture didn't take up a lot of space uh, here was one of the most uh, interesting the Okrasa crankshaft 
It was a counterweighted stroke or crank for those little engines. They were happy as heck to get, you know, three, four, five more horsepower out of them. And, uh, of course, they, uh, it, it, they made camshafts for them, too. And, of course, the jewel of the jewels, the jewel of the Nile here, was the Judson Supercharger. From time to time, Hot V Dubs has uh, done articles on the Judson Supercharger. And it was a, uh, uh, unlike the Roots uh, blowers, it uh, made contact. It was a vein type supercharger. And you had to run an accessory uh, can with a quart of oil in it. And it would drip feed, I guess, or suck into the supercharger as it was used and it would use like a quart of oil to lubricate that supercharger and the veins inside and the the by far the cheapest quickest way of adding power all the little other hop up things the the bigger valves more carburation everything done was topped and equaled by just adding a supercharger and for people that didn't want to get inside the engine and fiddles and stuff and wanted more power this was way to go and according to this book in the Judson company they sold over 65,000 of these supercharger kits now I don't know if that's overall and some of that was in Europe or how that doesn't specify on that but the way these things worked as you unbolted the carburetor and the supercharger went right on the intake manifold and you had to add a pulley on the crankshaft and then you adjusted the bull the pulley tension the belt tension by adding gaskets to raise or lower the supercharger and uh then you put the carburetor on richened it up changed the you know spark plugs and so on and so forth tuned it up and uh that was uh that was what they were doing now the 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 nice thing about the supercharger gave you a 50 percent increase in power in the mid-range but it wouldn't go to no 6,000 RPM and if you ran it down the highway for extended periods of time it would build heat and the power would start to fall off so you had to back out of it and if you came to long hills where you were going downhill you had to give it gas every once in a while to uh, lubricate that supercharger or you'd you'd burn it up because once the heat built up in it the horsepower fell away but they said back off and and it would come right back on uh, so I thought that was uh, pretty darn slick here and uh, just just a fascinating read and uh, good to learn some of those historical facts and uh, was uh, glad you stopped by so I could share it with you so uh, that 90 weight is still uh, dripping there so uh, I think I might go in and have a bite to eat but uh, thanks for watching thanks for subbing easy jeezy out